Um, I'm actually, almost nothing that I talk about is specific to WordPress, just like almost nothing you heard just now is really specific to Drupal. Um, so I'm going to do the same thing. So, uh, <clears throat> so that was a really good uh, talk about a lot of back-end systems, and if you want uh, me to do some of that too, happy to do that, especially into some of the Nginx and Varnish stuff. We do a whole lot of that, so if it's interesting to go into those details, I'm uh, happy to do that. What I want to do is go super detailed into doing front-end uh, optimization for any site. Uh, Dan mentioned that that's often where 80% of the performance problems are, so good, let's talk about those, right? And um, Dan also mentioned webpagetest.org. This is a report from webpagetest.org from a site called affiliatesummit.com, which was a, a conference that was in Austin uh, uh, three weeks, a month ago, whatever it was. Um, and uh, it happens to be a WordPress site, it doesn't matter at all, you'll see there's nothing specific about WordPress in it. Um, and um, Dan was right about, half right about WordPress, uh, I mean, uh, webpagetest.org, he said, it has a ton of really interesting data and graphs and stuff, and it gives you suggestions on how to fix it. And the part where it shows you a lot of stuff is true, and the part where it makes suggestions on how to fix it, um, uh, not as much. So that's what I want to do now for the next uh, 20 or 30 minutes, is show you how to use the information, the really kick butt information that is available here, and also similarly in Firebug, to make sites faster, and what to actually do with the various colored bars and things that it produces. Um, first of all, I don't actually like, by the way, using Firebug, even though you'll look at this and say, oh, Firebug does most of this. It does do a lot of it. And I don't like Firebug because Firebug is showing you the performance of your site plus the performance of your local network connection as it was at that very moment that you ran Firebug. And so it's really not that accurate or repeatable. Whereas what's nice about webpagetest.org, which is free, by the way, so there's no reason not to use it, is that they have servers all around the world. You can pick where you want it from, but they're all on an internet backbone, which means to a much greater uh, approximation than your laptop, it's actually showing you something about your server uh, uh, performance as opposed to the server plus other things that are, that are varying around because you're on a Time Warner cable and there's their, your neighbors around you are downloading uh, torrents of, of games and, and video porn and whatever they're doing that's <laughs> interrupting your your uh, your tests. So um, um, Dan also mentioned that the, the longer it takes your page to render, uh, the people leave, and it's almost like a half life. And uh, we found also with our uh, with our customers that often even just a second and of additional time, substantially like twenty or thirty percent of people will just hit the back button. And here's the worst part. You can't use Google Analytics to know it. Because if they hit the back button before the page loaded, then that means Google Analytics wasn't loaded. That means Google Analytics didn't know what happened. So you can't just look there and say, that's my bounce rate, that's the deal. I suppose you could go look at your logs and try to you know, uh, line that up with Google Analytics, but we all know that's, that's sort of a fool's errand too. The point is that it's very hard to measure those things. And the only way you really see it is making your site faster, and you see those things. We had a customer who, uh, by moving to us, made his site faster, but that's not, a, that's not a, an ad. I mean, if you make your site faster, he got a 20% lift in revenue just because he had that many more page views because people didn't hit back. And you could never know that unless you tried doing it. So it really is worth doing. And if we look at this site, what it's showing you is um, it's showing you one row for each resource that the browser is loading. So of course, it starts with the uh, HTML page itself, and then it goes on to, I know you might be able to read it, but you can probably guess style.css and some JPEGs and some JavaScript and other crap and keeps going, right? <clears throat> and what these bars are is this is time passing. Uh, 0.2 seconds, 0.4 seconds. It took about 4.6 seconds for this page to fully load. And each bar, as you can imagine, it's when this resource started loading, when the resource finished loading, and the colors tell you what was going on during that time. And actually, what's going on during that time is more important than it may seem, and this is where we can see our first like, really interesting thing that appears. <coughs> Because this gray thing, this gray bluish thing, is DNS lookup time. So forget about, it hasn't even called your server yet. The browser is just converting affiliatesummit.com into the uh, .aquata p address, right? It hasn't even touched you yet, and yet, look at that, almost uh, 200 milliseconds of the site of, of page load time is already occupied. And, and that's just your entire page load, right? Because obviously nothing can happen at all until it's DNS is resolved. It's actually quite a lot of time if you, if you think about it, if, if one second matters that much. That's a big proportion of the time. One reason why this is slow for them is because they use the C name to map 
by seeing record and DNS to map the www.affiliatesummit.com back to their sort of main root, whatever you want to call it, thing, which is just affiliatesummit.com, and that's where the A record was. So the reason this took longer is because first it had to go, first it asked DNS and it said, well, it's whatever Affiliate Summit is. Okay, well, what's that? And then finally it told it, in other words, two DNS requests instead of one. And by seeing kind of a big bar over here, it at least tees you off of like, that's interesting. We found that some DNS providers are 10 times faster than others. We even thought about DNS load speed or testing it. I didn't. But when you start seeing these kind of things, you start seeing that. In fact, you can see it right here where, oh, I don't know, um, APIs like Google.com. What do you know? Google's bar is maybe, I don't know, like a fourth of the size of that. Of course, Google's good at DNS, right? <laughs> but uh, I mean, maybe you don't care about <coughs> optimizing to the extent of DNS. But, that, but just to say that these little colored bars, they do actually matter. And some of those things can make an impact. So, um, okay. So the, 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 the biggest thing is this big bar on top, the HTML load time. And again, it's kind of obvious why. Because before the HTML starts coming back, all these other resources are unknown to the browser, and they can't even start loading it yet, right? And so the faster that HTML comes in, it's literally blocking the entire load of the site. And all the other stuff doesn't matter if the HTML is slow. If the HTML took four seconds, which it often does, especially with PHP, your site can't load faster than four seconds, right? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big block or big bottleneck. So you can see here it took about a second. That's not a long time for a PHP, a Drupal, or a, a, a WordPress app, especially on a shared server or something like that. That's not unusual. In fact, it's not unusual to be more like three or four seconds. And this is why what you heard just now about using something like Varnish is such a big deal. Because, again, oh, I don't have to repeat the Varnish thing. You already heard it. But the point is that Varnish will ask once and cache it in memory, and then Varnish will handle it and not actually even talk to Apache, much, much less run PHP. And what we found in our tests is even in fairly crappy cloud server line node, to $20 line node sort of uh, environments, you can get 1,000 hits per second out of Varnish. Like it's crazy, crazy fast, even in sort of a crappy environment, because it's all out of RAM and so on. And so it's just, it's just ridiculously fast. And so, I mean, taking from one second down to, you know, um, we, in our environment, it's usually between 50 and 70 milliseconds to start getting the first byte back from Varnish when it's cached. In, in other words, it eliminates essentially all of the time. I mean, the amount of time it takes the browser to ask is now overwhelming the time that it took Varnish to even answer. Um, so that's why things like Varnish are so important, because it kills this, this incredible bottleneck that's literally stopping the entire site from loading. Um, if you have an extremely static site, one thing that people do, is, does everyone know what a CDN is? Who does not know what a CDN is? Not know what a CDN is. So it stands for Content Delivery Network. The way it works is this. It, uh, just like Varnish is a cache, right? You ask Varnish, the first time it has to ask you for the content, and then after that it knows. CDN is just the same, except they have servers all around the world. And so when anybody comes to the CDN asking for your stuff, CDN will ask you once and then serve it after that. Except because it's around the world, there's another thing they can do. They can say, all right, if you're in Germany, then hit our servers in Amsterdam. And if you're in Austin, hit our servers in Dallas. If you're in Japan, hit our servers in Tokyo. Because imagine a server in Tokyo goes and hits your server in Dallas. It's going to take up to a second just to get the request in and back, just for, the, for it going over the ocean or, go, or bouncing over the satellites. And since the CDN has their servers over there, sure, the CDN takes that long time to get it, but then it's got it in Tokyo. Oh boy, so now when someone in Tokyo asks for it, super duper fast, as if you're in Tokyo. Huge, huge speed increase. Now the trouble is it's, it's usually hard to purge the cache in the CDN, or at least it takes a long time for the purge the cache. So if your site's really dynamic, it's not appropriate. But for your static content, like all of this stuff, it's perfect. And if your site is relatively static, you could actually put your entire site behind a CDN. And in fact, we have done that with some of our customers um, where they're going to get a, a tremendous load of traffic where they're really interested in performance, and it doesn't need to update constantly. And if you think about it, there's things like, even if it's Drupal and WordPress, and you have things like comments where people are doing it a lot. Well, yeah, but you can use Discuss or LiveFire, one of these JavaScript-oriented ones, so it's still not hitting your server, so you're still okay. And the more you can push these dynamic things out into the browser through these kind of services, or your own services, except they're coming um, off of an AJAX call, the more, you may, more of your content you may be able to put behind a CDN, for example. And a CDN you can almost think of as infinite scalability. I mean, the CDNs we use, um, many of them, uh, we use two, actually, and both of them do over 10 billion objects a day. 
Like, it's just stupid, stupid, stupid big. There's no way you could ever touch it. They do the Olympics, all kinds of just anything, right? It's just so big, you could, it's infinite it's for, for any practical consideration. So the more you can put it behind something infinite, in both speed, because they're all over the world, and scale, because they've got thousands and thousands of servers, you know, that, that's a win. So the more you can put there, the better, including your own homepage. Um, yeah. So one other little piece that I'll put in PHP, in the category of PHP in Drupal and WordPress, it, it's not necessarily easy to do this, but if you're not going to use Varnish, there is still something you can do to help you, your, your browser be faster. Um, when, when you start sending content out to the browser, the faster you can tell it, these are the next style sheets and JavaScripts that you need to load, the better, because the browser can, in parallel, as, in, as you can see, it does happen in parallel, the browser can, in parallel, start downloading those stuff. That those things. And so the faster you can release the browser to be doing that in parallel, the better. This is, again, second best if you're not going to use Varnish or something. And so the way you do that in PHP is you, you admit your head section, right, with your, step, your style sheets and JavaScript and whatnot. And then you flush the buffer. This is the big thing. So OB flush, and it depends on what things you have loaded, what is all necessary in order for it to really get flushed out. But you flush PHP's output, output buffer, so that crap gets sent back to the browser. Then you can take your sweet time rendering the, the crazy report table that you didn't put in a flat file and therefore takes 37 seconds to render from the data. Then you do that, right? Having flushed that content out to the browser so it can start loading those other resources. Again, second best to varnish uh, kinds of things, though. The other thing is, does anybody not know what gzip is? Compression, like zip. You, got, you know zip, right? So, it was mentioned that one of the things you can do is, is make sure you're zipping or compressing, gzipping, all of the stuff that's textual. So H, the original HTML and of course CSS and JavaScript as well. Why though? This is really cool. I mean, it sounds obvious, like, because it's smaller, so it will take less time to download. But how important is that really? Like, is, you know, is, how much of the download time is it really? And I want to show you why it's actually a really big deal. Um, in this particular HTML file, gzip would make it 71% smaller. That's basically four to one, which is totally normal for HTML and in fact for most of the kinds of text you have on the, on the website in general. Four to one. So let's look at the bar. The blue one is the amount of time it took to download the content. There it is. It's already rendered. It's all finished. PHP's done, all finished, doing the hard work. We're just spewing bytes back to the browser. That's all we're doing. That block from, let's say, uh, it's, it's about half of the second. In other words, half of the time. And you could take half the time and reduce it by four. In other words, you can make this substantially faster by just enabling that, in an, uh, that output handler in PHP, or what we like to do, which is run everything through Nginx, which I can talk about if we want to talk about that. And Nginx does that for us, which is actually a little more efficient, and, uh, and so on. So it does matter. And um, as we move into the CSS and JS, you'll, you'll see it matter actually even more. So first of all, it was mentioned before that you should combine the CSS and JavaScript. And all that, the, the simplest way that that means is you literally just concatenate the CSS files together. And you literally just concatenate the JavaScript files together. There's some exceptions where that doesn't quite work, but that's more or less what it means. And then you can minify it too. Minifying means you take out the comments, you take out extraneous white space, things like that. And uh, we found that you can do that. There's tools that will do all of the above. They'll concatenate all these things and minify. OK, fine. So if you're going to use a tool, you might as well. But the truth is that minifying doesn't matter if you're gzipping. Because it turns out that when you compress it, pretty much all that stuff gets taken out. And the incremental benefit you get out of minification, if you're also compressing, isn't that interesting. So if the tool does it already, fine. But minification sometimes causes bugs, we've determined. And so actually, it's, it's maybe just as well that you combine them and not minify them. Because you've got to cheese it, because that's their four to one in increase. That's silly, silly good. So why combine it? You can see why right here. So here's this style.css. See the browser started loading it there? It took half a second to load that sucker. It's a long time. And then here's layout.css, another CSS file. And look where the browser started loading. It didn't even start loading it until, what, half a second in, a third of a second in but behind that one? Whereas if this were together, it wouldn't have taken all this time for the browser to go ask. And all of that time, that, that content download, you would just put right there, and it would be done there. And the same is true with all these other CSS files. They would just appear right on the end and not be all those, not, not have all that extra time. Not only that, how scalable is your web server? How many connections per second can it do? I don't know, but if but there's one, two, three, four, five, uh, five six, 
seven, there's at least seven uh, JavaScript and CSS files in here. And so if they were just one CSS and one JavaScript, well, that's five fewer connections on every new visitor. That's a lot fewer, right? So however, however scalable your web server is, fewer, of course, makes it more scalable besides being faster. Um, if you're using WordPress, by the way, there's a plugin called BWP Minify. There is one called WP Minify, but there's reasons why that's abandoned. So now, BWP Minify is a plugin which will do this automatically. Just turn on this plugin, and it'll automatically take all the CSS and JS, make them into one thing, and minify it, and all that crap. So it's a free plugin. You just install it. It takes about two minutes. Just, just do it. <laughs> get it. Get the benefit for free. Now, all right, so this is all pretty basic. I, I imagine like a lot of you already know this stuff. So let me show you some cool things that you may not um, have known, and I'll show you why these charts prove this point. One thing I bet you've heard before is you should have lots of domain names, because browsers only open two connections per domain name, right? So here's affiliate summit.com. So there is a bunch of stuff floating, all these images and stuff, and sprites are good, but still, there's a lot of images and things. That's just the way it is. Okay. So the browser is only going to open two connections to this server and asking for stuff. And so people say, so here's what you should do. You should have a.affiliatesummit.com and b.affiliatesummit.com and c.affiliatesummit.com. And they all resolve to the same IP. It's all the same server. But by simply putting different domain names in front of different resources, well, now the browser is going to open two connections per domain name. Now you've got like eight or ten simultaneous connections sucking content down. So your site goes down a ton faster. Now, if you've done any of this web performance, you've heard this before, right? Completely not true, and I want to show you why it's completely not true, which is good news, because you don't have to do all that crap I just said. Um, but let me, let me show you why, because this, this is something you hear just constantly, and I want to show you why. So down here, well, first of all, let me go all the way, because here's a different view of the same thing. That was one line per resource. This one is one line per browser thread, one line per browser connection. So you can see here, there's a lot fewer things, because it, uh, it did ask for one resource from Affiliate Summit, and then another, and then another, and then another, and so forth, because it's reusing the connection because it's using Keep Alive. It was mentioned you got to use Keep Alive. If you weren't using Keep Alive, what you'd see is little spaces here, or you'd see just a billion of these connections as it's making one, and then having to make a new one, having to make a new one. And so if you see a ton of connections like that, that means Keep Alive is disabled, and that will destroy your performance. Just enable it. You literally change the Apache thing to say Keep Alive on instead of keep like off and you say Apache uh, graceful that is literally all you have to do so you have no excuse to not have keep alive. Anyway, even if you have it, so even with keep alive, look at this. First of all, it opens six simultaneous connections. It's first of all a myth, it used to be true, but it's a myth that browsers don't open up more than two connections. Yes they do, look they're doing it right now. And the other thing I want to show you why this is so cool is I'm going to scroll down here so on this chart you can see the whole thing at once. Um, there's CPU utilization, and then there's bandwidth. This is the interesting thing. So this is the amount of, of more or less, K per second that the browser is downloading at this moment in time. And of course, as there's a bunch of connections open, it's using a lot of bandwidth, right? Because it's down, downloading a lot of stuff at the same time. And here's the cool thing to look at. You notice that the browser, uh, you can see this, the, 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 uh, the line pretty much is pegged at the top during this entire period in here. And this, this line is the maximum speed of a cable modem. Maximum, like the bursty maximum, not the, not the you know, I'm, I'm, I'm four minutes into downloading my, my RIP DVR porn C DVD. But the first part where it's bursting and it's going real fast and you get real excited it's going to happen in only five minutes, that part. So this is, the, this is maxing out the bursty part of a cable modem. Well, the browser can't download the brights faster than the bursty part of the cable modem connection. It's never, you, you could have 8 million connections open and it's still not going to download more than this many bytes per second. And already, without all that domain name nonsense and trickery, it's already maxing it all out through almost the entire duration of loading the page. It's already maxing out. So more connections will not make it faster. In fact, it might make it slower because there's always little thingies that it has to do to start up the connection. It has to make the TCP connection and da -da -da -da, it has to do all this crap. So it's actually slower to open up more connections. So not a good idea to try to make more connections. Doesn't make the site load faster because bandwidth is zero sum game. Um, let's see. Keep alive. SSL. This is another good one. 
Another nifty thing that they show here, let's see, where does it show it? Um, the purple says SSL negotiation. That means that you are accessing a secure resource, in other words, HTTPS, right? Secure, I mean, it stands for SSL, but it's, you <coughs> remember it stands for secure, right? And so that involves an extra, uh, actually quite a lot of extra overhead in establishing the connections. A lot of stuff going on there, which is a talk all in itself, which I find really fun. But I'm gonna get rid of that. Wait, I mean, I guess it's useful, but I don't want to leave. You're in my way. How do I get rid of this thing? Is there a close box? You can click outside of it. Try me. Leave me. I clicked in the very last yeah. row. So, um, right, so, so the purple is SSL negotiation, which is this extra time after I've made the connection that I've got to then set up the secure part of this thing before I can start it all. And what you see is, like here's one, apis.google.com. See, Google says be secure, it's better. Oh yeah? Except it took an extra 200 milliseconds to load this stupid thing because it's secure. Does it need to be secure? No, almost nothing on the page almost ever needs to be secure on most applications. And yet, it's very common like this. There is one, uh, G stat, G plus, so their G plus ping is secure. It's a ping that has the G and the plus sign. Really, it has to be secure? But it is and it's costing them time because they put an S in front of there just like, they're, just like Google told you to. And here's some more uh, um, stuff, as you can see. And it's, it's very common for you to see uh, secure things that you probably didn't even notice were secure, or JavaScript loaded it. And so it wasn't obvious from the HTML that that's what happened, but that's what JavaScript did anyway. Uh, I talked to the person who made the site, and they had no idea that anything was secure on the site. Um, so this tool makes it super easy to see, and also easy to see that it's slowing you down. So that's an easy one, just don't do that. Um, oh, I forgot to say, uh, you know, we're talking about how much faster things can be. Right? Well, I'll do that at the end. Okay, so, um, yeah, CDN. So, so putting the CDN in front of all of your content is probably excessive and, and a pain in the ass because now you have to worry about caching and purging and all that. But for the static, the static content is almost everything. There's one thing on here that's dynamic, and everything else that isn't some other service altogether is static. HTML, uh, or sorry, CSS, images, and stuff. And so there's just no reason not to use a CDN. So there's ones like um, like Max CDN. It's really cheap. And uh, CloudFront is the Amazon ones. And now you don't have to actually host on Amazon to use it. And that's paid by use and also pretty cheap. And so I don't get any kickbacks from those guys. So don't worry about that. Those are cheap CDNs and it'll work. The one time, though, you should not use a CDN is if your site is, in fact, not big and doesn't get a lot of traffic. Because if you don't get a lot of traffic, then the first thing the CDN, the first time the CDN gets the connection, it asks you for it and it caches it. And then no one asks for like five minutes because your site doesn't get a lot of traffic. Well, I guarantee you by that time the CDN has dropped it out of its cache. Because the CDN is, is busy with customers like us, we move 200 million hits over a CDN a day. And so they're busy with people like us who are just hitting the living crap out of it and using the cache, right? And so five minutes later you're not in the CDN anymore. So now when someone comes to the CDN, well, it's not cached and they hit you again. In other words, you're never cached, and so you're just hopping over their servers and it's actually slowing you down, not better. So if you really don't get a lot of traffic, don't use a CDN, it won't, in fact, make it faster. But if you do get a lot of traffic, or if you're more interested in spikes, like I'm gonna be in the New York Times, okay, well then during that time, you are gonna get a big spike and the CDN's gonna make a massive difference, and so do that. But when you say a lot of traffic, what do you mean by that? I would say if you're getting hit less than once a minute, just the CDN's not going to help. Um, okay. And just to see what that looks like, you can see, actually, here's another thing that's also not, not normally obvious, but it's very obvious from this chart, which is part of why I like it. So here's all these JPEGs. JPEG, all, all these bars that are kind of long are, are more or less JPEGs. Here's a JPEG. And what's interesting is you might think, well, okay, so this JPEG took the half a second, this JavaScript took half a second. This JavaScript took a, a whole second, oh my god. And it came from Google too, what's up with that? I thought that was all like warp speed, I guess not. And so you might think like, well these two that are half a second, they're probably a certain size, and this one that's bigger, well that must be twice as big. If you actually like mouse over like this, and look at how big these are and how long it took, you'll find that there's actually no relation at all. The tiny little thing takes a second, and a big thing went down fast for some reason. There's a ton of variation in your servers normally for this stuff. Like this, look at this thing. This is a, what, some logo. 
but I moused over it and it's like it's not that big, it's like not that much different than this than this JPEG, and yet it's three times longer. There's just natural crazy variation and stuff. And if I ran this report again, all these bars would kind of be different. Because it's just variation, it's not fixed in stone. So there's kind of two things about that. Uh, one is this is probably on a, a crappier shared host, and that's that's part of what you get on a shared host is you're not in control of the environment. So the environment shakes around from underneath you. Really not much you can do. But a CDN helps clean this out. If you look at my blog, you'll see like 70 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds, 100 mil. It's just like this, this super clean, fast thing because all the servers are doing is using Nginx to serve static content and doing nothing but serving, but moving bytes around. And so it's it's it, consistency is not really the point. The point is that it's fast and it doesn't do as much of this weird uh, random variation stuff. Um, okay. So we did the bandwidth thing. So here's here's some interesting things about this particular report. Um, on, on this on this particular site, if the HTML was gzip, they would save um, half a second of total page load time just if the HTML was gzip. If all their other textual content there was gzip, so like you know again all these things get in their own space but a little smaller and combined, they would save a whole second and a half of page load time doing that. And then there's smushing images, and this is another thing Dan mentioned, is that you can get stuff out of images. And if you're into image processing, you're like, I know what they're doing, they're taking the ping and they're re-encoding it as a JPEG, so it'll have all the weird JPEG artifacting in it, and yeah, it's smaller and it also looks like ass, I don't want to do that. But that's not what those tools do. They do things like they get rid of chunks in the, in the header that you don't need, or in ping in particular, ping has four different compression algorithms, and it can change compression algorithms within the image, but almost nothing that writes pings bothers with all that nonsense. Whereas these tools will sit there and for each set of four lines they'll decide which compression algorithm is best right about now and so on and so forth. So they can make it bit or you know pixel for pixel identical, except sometimes it's small. In this particular site, um, we ran it. Oh, here's how you do this, by the way. You go to something called Smush It, which is a Yahoo tool. It's free. All this stuff is free except the CDN, but that's not too expensive. Smush, uh, Smush It is free, and you can give it a URL like this. It'll rip all the images down. It'll smush it, right? It gets rid of the stuff to the extent possible. And then it lets you download a zip file of all of those smushed images in the right, in the correct subdirectories that match your URL thing. So you can just take that zip file and expand it into your project, and you're done. I mean, maybe unless you map URLs, but like, it's pretty easy, in other words. Again, this will take you about five minutes, maybe 10, and it's free. So in this particular case, it would save another 50K. 50K, which is another half of a second in this particular case. Again, 10 minutes of your time once, you save a half a second on every page load, do it! Right? Even if you're going to do the CDN, do it anyway. It's like, this is so easy. So, gzip on, keep alive on, uh, put the resources together, you smush it, maybe use a CDN if, if you're, you know, have some traffic. And this site alone would take this 1.4 seconds and, and certainly under a second and maybe even a little bit more. And if you varnish on the HTML, it would be more like a half a second half a second to load a page. That's so fast that you know it makes a huge difference to the user. And you guys probably know this, and I don't know if you guys care about this per se, but also the search engine position is based on part, part on, on the speed of the site. And when the site gets below a, a second, it starts to make a bigger difference. Um, and then uh, one last thing is, is just having fewer things if, if it'll come back on. So this particular site has something like 50 items in it. And just having fewer items, you know, this was again said before, just do less. That's, I guess, most optimization is do less, right? Um, and so um, just doing, just, just, you know, they have this weird stuff. Here's some ad server, and, and I think they, they called the Google APIs twice because there's one in the header, and maybe someone put it in the footer and forgot it was in the header, all kinds of stupid stuff like that. It happens, right? You, you generate this cruft over time, and that stuff happens. And, you know, looking at a tool like this, maybe you want twice a year, maybe? That doesn't, you know, not often, or just whatever you feel like trying to make it faster just to look for that kind of stuff. Super easy uh, to do that. So again, it's web page test.org and it's free. And they have a bunch of other tabs with all kinds of stuff in it that you can poke around. But you can see how much you can learn just from just from poking around what you see uh, there. One other nice thing this does, um, Dan had mentioned there's perceived page load time and there's like kind of full page load time. And in general, the perceived page load time is what matters. So they give you something neat here. You see this green line, I'll scroll down a little bit. You see this green vertical line here at 1.4 seconds. What that is, is at this moment, the browser is not white anymore. It's not white screen anymore. It's got something. Now all the images aren't in, and 
it's still chunking around and the Facebook like button is, is not there. You know, right, it's not finished. Here's where it's finished, but here's where it's not white anymore. And that's, again, that, that is indeed a, a really critical point for the human interface point of view. So it shows you that point as well. So that's, that's super nice, right? Because getting this line over is much more important than that line. And frequently this line is all kinds of weird stuff like Facebook Connect crap and stuff you can't really control that well anyway. So a lot of times the stuff kind of on this end is like, that. well, oh well, <laughs> right? But the stuff on this end you definitely can control and, and makes a huge difference um, on that end. So for example, sprites. Sprites are a good idea. That's when you take multiple images, maybe one big image, and then use CSS to say things like, well, shift it over like this and, and put it there, so that's that image, and then shift it over here and put it here in that hole, that's that image. In other words, it's, it's, it's playing like a game where there's little windows in your site and it's moving the same image around, and that's faster. But you may, but it's kind of also, it can be also a pain to do sprites. So you might say, well, the stuff to the left of the screen line, that's what I'm going to spriteify, because that will matter a lot. And the rest of these images, maybe it doesn't matter as much, so maybe they don't need to be sprites necessarily on that side. So that's, that, again, this, this line gives you some kind of priority, maybe, of what things are worth tackling uh, versus the stuff on the other side of the line less important to tackle. So that's a that's my dump on the front end. I don't know how much time we have or whether anyone wants to go into more stuff like Nginx or any of that in any more detail or if everyone's all tired. <laughs> how much time? Uh, we're, we're actually uh, good on time. Um, do you uh, want to go over that stuff quickly or? Yeah, let's see. Um, so Varnish is, is, is a really good tool and it's been said a few times here so obviously that's cool. But it's also intimidating and scary because if you, because it's got its own configuration language and it is very complicated in fact and you can take an example file off the web and it's a start but I don't know anyone that's able to just run off of those and make it work like Apache often actually can do more or less out of the box. So it's, it's, it's a big commitment. And so I would say that, that um, uh, you know, unless you're going to dive in and, and like really try to squeeze every last bit out, an interesting sort of first step instead is to start with Nginx, which has also been said a few times here. So maybe I could talk about uh, Nginx a little. So Nginx is a web server. It's 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 from uh, these Russian guys. So everything you see there has like weird Soviet stuff all over it. Like, oh, this is interesting. And then you know it has like it has more or less English documentation. And then there's always some link to the original, and you click it, and you're like, oh, <laughs> okay. Never mind, back to safe. Um, but Nginx is designed to have a very low memory and CPU footprint and to not do anything. So it's sort of like a mainframe, right? It's designed for 2,000 people all simultaneously out to lunch. So, that's, so Nginx is designed to do nothing. In other words, Nginx can't run PHP. It can't run code at all. In fact, all it can do is move bytes. All it can do is move bytes. That's it. It just moves bytes around. But it moves it around really, really well. So too bad it can't run PHP, too bad it can't do all those things, but boy can it move bytes around that already exist that are produced by other things. So for example, um, like I was saying with Varnish getting something like a, even a, like a really crappy cloud server type of thing, Varnish can usually pump out like 800 to 1,000 connections per second. Nginx is more like 3,000, 4,000. And it's not necessarily that you need to serve 4,000 things per second, it's more of a demonstration that it's so incredibly efficient that I think, uh, I bet these guys will not, but you can, put, you can put Nginx on any server, no matter what else it's doing, and it's going to do that kind of performance and not affect anything and never crash ever, ever, ever. It's like one of those rock solid things that just works so amazingly well. And it never takes CPU, and it never takes a lot of RAM. Never, never, never. I mean, we, we, have, we have hundreds and hundreds of servers, and again, we run millions and millions of hits per day. Never once in two years has Nginx been the source of a CPU or a RAM problem or any, really any other problem I can think of, and never once does it crash. Like, it's just such a rock, it's like the kernel. Okay, so good at moving bytes, but can't do anything else. So what is it that, so, okay, so why do we need to just move bytes? So, first of all, there's a lot of bytes that are already there on disk. Since it's already there, and Nginx doesn't have to do anything but move them, then it's very good at that. So a typical Nginx configuration can be only like 15 or 20 lines long, and uh, it says, more or less, hey, whatever the connection comes in, just see if we can find this sucker on disk. Does it look like maybe this thing's on disk? Yes? Out it goes. No? Well, we'll have to actually ask Apache, and I'll explain what ask Apache means in a minute. Just that, just that configuration. If it's on disk, good. If it's not, ask Apache. And that's it, that, that's your whole Nginx configuration. You get this amazing performance and scale benefit right away because um, 
it will serve those files just ridiculously fast and scalable. You don't need a CDN. It's okay. In fact, we had a customer once who was getting 2,500 hits per second. 2,500 hits per second. And the CDN was failing in New York or some kind of thing. So we disabled the CDN, and it all came to us. And Nginx ate that sucker, and it worked. <laughs> That's a lot, right? And, the, right? and we weren't even, we were depending on the CDN. We weren't even ready uh, you know, necessarily to do that, but it just works. It's that, it's that good. So number one, all that static content stuff I just said with the CDN and the da 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 da, -da it's just really, really good now. And all that variation, well, not, maybe if you're on a shared host or something, OK, you have a lot of variation from that environment because you've chosen to not spend a lot of money and therefore get variation. But unlike Apache, you will have no variation in how fast Nginx goes. It's going to just go really fast. And that's on your images and your CSS and your JS. And also, Nginx can automatically gzip anything that looks like text. So all that stuff about, oh, we got to make sure. Yeah, here's how you make sure. Literally, there's a command in Nginx. You say gzip on, semicolon. There's a couple of things that, that are defaults. They're fine. Defaults are fine. And there you go. It's all done. The stuff on disk, the stuff that Apache might crap out, uh, including the HTML itself. All gzip for you there. That was easy. <laughs> right? Again, it's like super duper easy, super fast, does a lot of the stuff for you, and so on. OK, so, so, so it just moved bytes. So OK, fine. What about, you know, what about PHP? Obviously, it's not just moving bytes. So there are all these options. There's PHP, uh, um, FCGI, FP, FHM. I can't remember all the, the order of those letters, but you know what I mean. Fast CGI. Anyway, yeah. there's stuff that just stays in Nginx. But let's suppose you say, look, I know Apache. I like Apache. I've got this GOIP module. I like HD access, blah, blah, blah. I like Apache. OK. So that's fine. You can keep Apache. So here's what you do. Nginx is now listening on port 80, not Apache, right? Because we want Nginx first, because Nginx is the badass. So he gets to go first. But then you still have Apache running it. So now it's running on some other port. doesn't matter what it is. 8080 is kind of the typical, but it doesn't matter. And you firewall that, by the way, so no one can get to that. So it's nice and safe. All right, so now there's, again, a, a small and easy set of commands in Nginx. And this, you can actually just get off the internet and paste, and it works. That simply says, well, I don't know. Go ask the, whatever's running on 8080. And just pass whatever you got. Just go, I don't know. You do it. It doesn't matter if it's posts or puts or deletes or all kinds of weird stuff. That's fine, too. It's just, yeah, you. And then, of course, Apache will send bytes back, and, that, and Nginx goes, this, I know what to do with. I'm good at moving bytes, and it just sends it right back. OK, so this sounds useless, and it's really not useless. I'll tell you why. So it already sounds good, because all that static stuff's handled, and the dynamic stuff's a pass-through. So it's already, a, it's already good. It's already a benefit. But it's way better than it sounds, and here's why. So let's suppose you're this side. It takes a second to load, and that's good enough. Let's suppose one second. OK, so now. Now let's suppose um, there's, 10, can, there's 10 simultaneous uh, hits to this website um, because they just got uh, some press somewhere, some tweet went out, some big Twitter -er just tw tweeted it out, and so they just got 10 connections. So that means Apache is going to, so 10 Apache threads are each going to be running for a second, um, right, trying to generate that content in back. Uh, 10 is actually is kind of starting to get to be a lot, actually, when you consider that well, if you're doing 10 simultaneous things, do you have 10 processors? No, because Apache's actually fairly CPU bound. So now it's going to take more than a second. You can see where this is going, right? Like, like the fact that there's more of them kind of piles up, it gets really bad. You've seen those kind of things before. And it gets worse again, because, and if this will come back, yeah. So this part was the, uh, I can scroll up so you can see. This green part, this green part is the, uh, the time to first byte, meaning Apache's th thinking about it. <laughs> I'm going to render it. And here's the download time, right? We did that. OK. So Apache took this long to render it, about half a second. At that moment, Apache was finished with the hard labor of PHP. Now, all it's doing at that point, at this point, the, the, the boot point, is moving bytes. See where I'm going with this? This part is just moving bytes through the browser and not doing anything else. So during this time, we're using a tool, Apache, which is taking 172 megs of RAM because I don't even know why, <laughs> right? But there it is, taking all that RAM. So you can't have many of these threads on a machine. 40 would be a lot. How about 15? So you're not thrashing, right? And it's, it's sitting there doing nothing but moving bytes, taking up all that space and RAM, not processing PHP or doing something else useful, just waiting on this I.O. for wholly half the time. Does that make sense? Whole half? Uh oh. <laughs> For half the time, it's doing nothing but moving bytes. The thing that Nginx is really good at and can do like a billion times a second, and bit, right? So you can see where I'm going here. Right tool for the job. Nginx is good at this part. It can do this all day long. Apache's got to do this part. 
So here's why this proxy to Apache is so bad. Oh, by the way, this was, this was at full cable modem, go to hell, full throttle speed. <laughs> With this, this thing is like this, and Apache's still sitting there doing nothing, a whole thread. Now even less scalable because it's sitting around doing that, right? So here's why this Nginx thing is so badass, because it didn't just proxy the bytes back and forth like I just said. It didn't just do that. Here's what it really did. Got the request from the client, it goes, oh, it's not on disk. The rule is, if it ain't on disk, I ask Apache. So, okay, so it sends it to Apache. So Apache does this part and thinks real hard and runs PHP. Okay, can't get around that, right? So Apache then is finished and ready to stream the bytes back. Except it's not talking to the browser, it is Apache. It's talking to Nginx. So guess what Nginx does? It moves bytes. It buffers it. So Apache shits out the 150K, right? Nginx goes, I got it. It takes the whole 150K and goes, I got it. You're done, Apache. Your thread is finished. I'm closing the connection to you, this little local connection. right? I'm closing it. We're finished. I got what I needed from you. And now it's got this. It can even spool to disk if it's super huge, blah, blah, blah. It's good at all. Remember, good at moving bytes. Don't worry about it moving bytes. It's really good at that part. So it's got the 150K. It says, I'm finished with you. Then Nginx sits there as long as it takes, even if, the, even if this guy sort of crapped out in the middle so the connection's hung for two minutes, while Nginx's going, hey, did you get that pack? You didn't? I'll resend. It's cool. I'll resend. Right? It's doing all that for two minutes. But Nginx is doing that. Remember, it can do thousands of them at the same time and thousands of them per second. No worries. So it doesn't matter. And Apache's done. As soon as Apache's finished running the code, Apache's done. So now when the next, you know, next of these 10 things comes in, and then Nginx goes and acts Apache, and it's got an available connection, because it's not waiting on all of this to go. And so in this particular example, you can see it literally would immediately double the capacity of the machine, because it just got rid of that part of Apache. And of course, in general, this is the best case. This is the fast cable mode case. The best case, uh, I mean, the, uh, you know, the, the fastest case for downloading. Right, is double. In, in general, browsers are not that fast, and not that fast, and so forth. So actually, Nginx can make the dynamic, con the, the, dynamic uh, the scaling the dynamic part of the site, which is the hard part to scale, not the images. Right, That's not the hard part to scale. You can get a CDN. It's the dynamic part that's hard. But it's made your server two, three, four times more scalable because it buffered it, and it's going to move the bytes. And this is all before you get into actually some interesting new things, as, as, as was described, where you don't even have Apache. OK, fine. But even with Apache, you can make Apache that much more scalable, because Nginx is doing that also buffers it. OK, so Nginx, simple. All it does is move bytes. But it's so good at it and so smart about how it's going to do that, that just dropping that little puppy in there in front of Apache and leaving Apache, except for the ports listening on. Otherwise, just leave it be. You're good. Nginx will do the keep alive. So if Apache doesn't do it, screw it. And the next can do it anyways, right? And so on. Like all those little bits and pieces we just said, uh, like half the things we just said, it can do. So the final thing there is Nginx has a cache in it, like a content cache, sort of like Varnish. So in other words, it can not only go ask Apache for those bytes, da 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 da, but it could save those and go, well, this is what the home page looks like. I'll just keep it. And the next time someone asks for the home page, well, I'll just give it back. And I'm Nginx. I can give it back super fast, faster than Varnish. And I don't even need Varnish. Yes, because Venginex sounds friendly, and even though it's weird in, in, in Soviet, and whereas in <laughs> Varnish, it sounds more approachable, and in fact, is actually kind of a trick to get working. It has bugs, by the way, with the distributed backends. Um, you'll get 503s on there because they have bugs in their this, in their distribution. So anyway, um, so uh, so the thing about the Nginx caching, as I think was mainly mentioned, is that the your ability to set how and when it's cached and when the cache is purged. Like if you publish, in, to take the WordPress example, if you publish a new post, then the home page is no longer uh, valid anymore because it's got to show that new post, right? So you need to you need to somehow tell Varnish or Nginx, hey, that stuff's old, throw it away. You got to ask me again. Varnish has very very good stuff to support that. Nginx has very very poor stuff to support that. Mm -hmm. And there's there's even things like someone wrote a module for Nginx. You can compile in, and it kind of adds a little of that, but not enough. And it's one of those like. Oh, I can tell I shouldn't really even do this. So in general, I sort of, I recommend like just don't, just don't, don't mess around with the Nginx uh, caching thing unless your site is super duper static and you're just not worried about uh, purging the cache and it doesn't matter. 
or, or, and we do have, we do have some customers like this. It's dynamic, but it's cool if you cached it for like two minutes, just two. So you never. So if I publish a new article, the homepage could take up to two minutes before Nginx finally decides it's stale. If that's okay with you, and many sites it is okay, or at least it's a good trade for that speed and scale. Like you're like, eh, in the balance, I'd, I'd rather have a little slight inconsistency for a minute or two. I'll take that if my site's like super scalable and and uh, and and, uh, and fast. Um, then you could. Do, then I do recommend it. Because then you don't care that it's not so uh, configurable and it's not so smart. Because you're like, ah, it's only two minutes, and I've already decided I'm cool with it being wrong for two minutes. And, uh, and actually, that can work really well. And Nginx, again, all that scalability we just talked about with statics and so on are now applied to dynamic content. If you're cool with that and with a lot of user generated content, that's not okay. The other kind of sites it is. So, anyway, of course, you use your judgment. Now, also, it is very easy in Nginx to be very specific about when to do this. So you could say, for example, with URLs that start like this, or only if it's a git, or only if the cookie's not there, and all that. You, it is easy to say only if all that stuff, then use the cache. So maybe you could be judicious and say, like, well, you know, there's a lot of kinds of requests and a lot of kinds of pages where this would be appropriate. I'll just select there. It's not all or nothing. So and again, if you're going to be not all or nothing, it's selective, or if it's cool that it's inconsistent for a brief time, then I like it, and then you've avoided varnish altogether. But even without uh, the page caching at all. I think I made the point that Nginx is, is a great tool, um, you know, and a good good thing. And, and there's also, again, with like 20, 30 lines of configuration, you can do everything I just said, and you can find that online. So that's really cool. But also, there's a rich uh, uh, thing there with lots of things that it can do. It can take you to more places. So, for example, with Memcached, there's a module that lets you talk directly to Memcached from Nginx. So one thing you can do, for example, is the the, the, your, your, your Drupal server, your WordPress server, can pre-compute certain things and stuff them in memcached, and Nginx can read it. So what that means is, suppose you do have uh, you know, the, the counter thing or whatever, that's a JSON thing which some Ajax calls in, uh, to display. Well, uh, that Ajax call back to Nginx could rip that out of memcached and return it and never hit, again, never hit PHP and so forth. And again, it can do that um, forever in a day because it's just moving those bytes. And you can even say things in Nginx like, we'll go hit memcache. If it's not there, we'll then go back and ask the back end, of course, of course, I need to have something. But if it is there, then good. So there's all these, so in other words, you can start simple and just be, I say I'm finished. But you can actually get super complicated with it if you want. There, there is a rich thing you can have there if you want. So you're also setting yourself up for something more complicated if you want later, which also makes it a, a nice tool. So that's my. Pitch for Nginx. You better not make money when people use it. All right, thanks.